This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Grotto. We here at the Word of the Week, like many GMs, understand the importance of synonyms. By synonyms, of course, we mean mostly interchangeable words, words that have the same or at least similar meanings. Which is exactly what synonym means. It's a way of saying the same thing with different words. Of course, the word synonym and its antonym, antonym, come from the Latin. The nym part comes from the word for name. Syn means togetherness or sameness, and anti means oppositeness. Except that anti part comes from the Greek, not the Latin. The language is funny, which is why it is so hard to think of another word for synonym, or a shorter word for monosyllabic. But we digress. The point is, synonyms are the narrative and world-building game master's bread and butter. Otherwise, we tend to get repetitive. We pointed that out a long, long time ago when we admonished people not to call every underground complex a dungeon, and then rattled off a whole host of synonyms. The Legend of Zelda might be able to get away with having the player exploring six different things all named dungeon or palace or temple in a row, but your average GM needs a little more variety. It's better that the players go from the volcano dungeon to the water shrine to the desert palace to the ice fane. And even better if they are called things like Shrine Aqueous, the Hori Fane, and the Dungeon of Pahoyhoy. Yes, Pahoyhoy. It's Hawaiian for paddle. It's a type of lava. As opposed to Aa. Uh -uh. Look it up. Or better yet, don't. We'll probably do lava at some point and you don't want to ruin it. See, when it comes to naming dots on a map, there is no more useful or important skill than knowing a dozen synonyms for the same basic feature. The problem is you can't just use synonyms willy-nilly, because eventually one of your players is going to actually know that the tomb they are exploring is really more of a cope than a sepulcher. And they will make fun of you for naming it wrong until the lich crawls out of his vault and disintegrates the offending player's character. But the damage will already have been done. And that's why you have us to help you come up with other names for things by giving you a rich vocabulary of synonyms. So the next time your party is exploring the cave of Grizzly Demise, you can recognize it for what it is and give it a better name. Like the Grotto of Grizzly Demise. And fill it with grotesqueries. Actually, a grotto is precisely the sort of cave space that fantasy adventure should be exploring. If you know the word, you probably know it's some kind of a cave, but you may not be quite sure what makes a grotto a grotto as opposed to just another cave. And if you are sure what makes a grotto a grotto, you might be wondering if they really are really age appropriate for your fantasy game. See, grottos actually have very strong connections to the opulent and romantic architectural design style that became popular during the Victorian period in England that ran from the 1850s to the 1890s. This period is, of course, named for Queen Victoria, the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland from 1837 to 1901, and who also served as the Empress of India starting in 1877. Victoria was the second longest reigning monarch in the history of Britain, and she reigned during a period of great change to the nation in the British Empire. And her strict ethics and strong will left an indelible mark on life in England during the period. Which is why her name, is synonymous with the entire period of British history. Alexandrina Victoria was born in 1819. She was the only child of Edward, King George III's fourth son, and Victoria Saxe Southfield Coburg, sister of King Leopold of Belgium. As such, she was fourth in line for the throne of England. Being of such a prestigious birth, she was well educated, but also brought up quite strictly. Despite that, she was reportedly a lively and warm-hearted child with a talent for writing and painting. Sadly, her father, Edward, died in 1820, and her father's three surviving brothers had no legitimate heirs themselves. So suddenly, a year after her birth, she went from being fourth in line for the throne to being the heir apparent. After King George III died, her uncle, William IV, succeeded him. And when William passed away in 1837, Victoria became the queen at the age of 18 years old. Soon thereafter, she married Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg, her cousin. 
While the strong-willed couple clashed frequently, they were intensely devoted to each other and they formed a strong team when it came to navigating the difficult political waters of Europe in the 19th century. See, the 19th century was a time of great change in Europe, well, across all of the West, really. Because this little thing was happening that you might have heard of called the Industrial Revolution. And that's not something we can cover in a short little paragraph as part of a discussion of Victorian garden features. Yes, that's where this is all going. Suffice to say, farming and handcrafting were on the way out, and industry and manufacturing were on the way in. New energy sources, new raw materials, and new inventions were changing everything. The economy of the world was shifting from an agrarian to an industrial focus, and new advances in communication and transportation were shrinking the world. Cities were growing, education was spreading, and a great deal of new wealth was finding its way into the hands of people who had never had it before. As a result, investment in infrastructure, philanthropy, and great civic works were also exploding. It was also during this period that European expansion and imperialism surged anew. The size of the British Empire doubled under the reign of Queen Victoria. Canada, Australia, and India fell under her rule, as did possessions in Asia and the Pacific. It was during this period that the phrase was coined, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And so, it was during this period that a lot of wealthy people started to really flaunt their wealth. And that's when the Victorian style, with its large estates and opulent grounds, became popular. And in keeping with the joint zeitgeist of flaunting wealth and demonstrating the indomitable spirit of humanity over the natural world, elaborate gardens became de rigueur. While manicured formal gardens were all the rage at first, gradually, a new spirit of naturalism also took over. So later Victorian gardens were designed to look natural, to not show the domination of humanity over nature so much as to emphasize and tame the natural beauty of the world. But both styles involved the same basic mix of artificial and natural features. Amongst the bright flowers, hedges, and ferns, and fern collecting was very popular at the time, various artistic props and ornaments were scattered. These included sundials, urns, statues, and benches in imitation of classical Roman and Greek art. Structures like pavilions and gazebos were all the rage as well. Gardens were contained in decorative iron fences, and hidden features to be discovered by curious explorers were also quite popular. Enter the grotto. A grotto is a natural or artificial cave or rock enclosure used as a decorative feature. They were often decorated with fanciful rock, bone, shell, and glass arrangements. They usually included water features like ponds or springs, and often included water plants and ferns as well. Basically, a grotto, in the gardening sense, is a little enclosed hidey hole that imitates a natural cave. Well, we say little, but they could be pretty darned elaborate. Consider the story of John and Lisa Harris of Monmouth, England. In 1999, the well-off couple dropped the equivalent of 880,000 U.S. dollars, which would be about 1.3 million U.S. dollars today, on a five-bedroom Victorian house called Dewstow. While they were trying to tame the house's garden, they discovered a few buried steps that led right into the ground. So they did what any couple would do. They started digging to find out what the heck was under their garden and house. The stairs bottomed out at a small grotto with a pond and a waterfall. And then there were more steps. And a tunnel. And another underground grotto. And a buried greenhouse. Under their home was an entire network of underground ponds and waterfalls and grottos and gardens, all constructed in the 19th century by the estate's then-owner, Henry Oakley, a director of the Great Western Railway Company. Over the next several years, the couple restored the labyrinth of gardens and opened them to the public. And then in 2011, the couple sold the property for the equivalent of over 3.3 million U.S. dollars. Unearthing an extensive labyrinth of natural and artificial garden caves underneath an old mansion is the stuff adventures are made of. As is discovering a treasure that would be worth roughly... 12,100 gold pieces at current gold prices, with some reasonable assumptions made for the size of a gold coin. We did the math. 
In case you're curious, we posit a single gold piece is worth roughly 275 US dollars at current gold prices. But we digress. The problem is, though, that these grottos are 19th century constructs. That certainly doesn't fit with the pseudo-medieval fantasy age at all, does it? But here's the thing. The grotto wasn't invented in the 19th century. It just became popular in the 19th century. Or rather, it became popular again in the 19th century. And interestingly enough, that was based on another buried labyrinth filled with treasure. Grotesque treasure. But to tell that story, we have to start with one of the most infamous emperors the Roman Empire ever had. Born in 37 CE as Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, Nero Claudius Caesar took his new name at the age of 13 when his mommy got him a new daddy, much to the relief of anyone who had to say his old name. That new daddy being the Roman Emperor Claudius Caesar. After discarding two husbands, Nero's mother Agrippina married Claudius and arranged for Nero to marry Claudius' daughter, Octavia. The move effectively put Nero in line for the imperial throne. Fortunately, when Nero was 17, Claudius died of adult-onset mysterious circumstances that certainly had nothing to do with him being fed poisoned mushrooms by his wife and basically being the third in a line of discarded husbands. And so Nero became the emperor of Rome. Well, sort of. Because during the first few years of his rule, which actually went pretty well, Nero let his advisors and his mother do most of the ruling. Except that one of his advisors, the famous philosopher Seneca, didn't like the way the ambitious Agrippina was handling things and convinced Nero to push her aside. Agrippina was not happy about this and tried to wrest control of the imperial throne by using Claudius' other son, Britannicus. But Nero was a very good student, and he'd learned a lot from his mother. Britannicus had a nasty fall and died. And then Agrippina herself tripped and fell onto a knife. Several times. And so Nero was left pretty much in control. Surprisingly enough, given his upbringing and method of attaining power, Nero was not a nice guy. In fact, he was pretty much a monster. He had his wife Octavia executed, and then, in what was described by the historian Tacitus as a casual outburst of rage, Nero killed his second wife with a single kick to the abdomen. But apart from his temper, Nero wasn't much of a dictator, or any sort of a ruler. Nero fancied himself an artist, and an athlete, and a showman. He just wanted to create and perform. He instituted all sorts of public games and performances. He himself often played the lyre at various events, and he ordered several nobles to take dancing lessons. He raced chariots, too. And he was an architect. And he had a vision for redesigning the city of Rome around a grand palace worthy of his greatness. Problem was that Rome was kind of already there. And then, as luck would have it, on June 19th of 64 CE, a fire broke out in the center of Rome, and the fire quickly spread through the city. Over the course of nine days, the fire destroyed three of Rome's 14 major districts and severely damaged another seven. Now, no one is saying that Nero started the fire. Well, actually, a lot of people have said exactly that. But several sources indicate that he was actually in his own estate at the time, in costume and doing a performance of the Greek epic, The Sack of Ilium. And that's the source of the old saw about Nero fiddling while Rome burned. We have to be clear about this, because of the number of convenient mysterious circumstances that put Nero on the imperial throne. There is no clear evidence, one way or the other, that Nero started the fire, or had it started. It's one of those mysteries of history that will never be resolved. Of course, Nero was pretty clear that he didn't start the fire, but he knew who did, and he did not waste a moment punishing the guilty parties, the members of a new religion that was catching on in Rome. The Christians. Christians were rounded up in droves, 
Some were dressed in animal costumes and torn apart by dogs. Others were burned to death in great bonfires that illuminated Nero's garden parties. And then, Nero got to work rebuilding the city. On Palatine Hill, at the heart of the city, Nero built a massive palace complex called Domus Aurea, called the Golden House. And in the heart of the palace, he commissioned a 100-foot-tall bronze statue of himself, the Colossus of Nero. He built a new circus for chariot racing, as we've discussed before, and then proceeded to reconstruct Rome according to his artistic vision. But there was a problem. Well, there were lots of problems. As we noted, Nero wasn't much of a ruler at all. He really didn't have much interest in running the empire. And that was causing some problems abroad. In Britain and Judea, revolts were becoming commonplace. Meanwhile, Nero's massive reconstruction effort emptied the Roman treasury. He responded by reducing the silver content of the Romans' coins, effectively making everyone's money worthless. Ultimately, Nero faced a lot of grumbling and criticism, and more than a few threats, which he responded to with his characteristic tact and calm. After executing numerous political officials and his own advisor, Seneca, Nero was exhausted and decided to take a vacation to Greece. He immersed himself in Grecian art and culture, and even drove a chariot in the Olympic Games. While he did that, a revolt started in Gaul and spread to Spain and Africa. The governor in Spain, Galba, after dealing with the revolt himself, decided that enough was enough. He declared himself the legate of Rome, and the Senate and the Imperial Guard, for some reason not feeling very loyal to Nero, pledged themselves to Galba and declared Nero to be an enemy of the people. When Nero came back from his Grecian vacation, he found himself facing arrest and execution. And so, in one last bit of rage, he took his own life, lamenting that the world was losing a great artist with his death. Nero's fall meant the end of the Caesar dynasty, and Rome collapsed into disarray thereafter. What followed was called the Year of Four Emperors, as various factions vied to seize control of Rome. Tacitus described the period thereafter as a period rich in disasters, even in peace full of horrors. Now, Nero's legacy wasn't the only thing to crumble. Over the following years, his great palace, Domus Aria, was gradually destroyed, buried, and new works were built over them. The main building of the palace was leveled and turned into a public bath complex called the Baths of Titus in 80 CE. Those baths were demolished, and a new public bathhouse was built on top of them in 110 CE by the Emperor Trajan. And Nero's legacy was forgotten. Until the 15th century, that is. See, Nero's Domus Aria required massive foundations, and his own private baths and galleries, which had been built over and buried for centuries, remained intact. The result was a weird network of cavernous baths, galleries, and stonework that were unearthed during construction in Rome in the 15th century. The underground baths and halls were nicknamed the Grote, which means the cave or the underworld. But that's not all that was discovered. Recall that Nero was an artist and he had filled his palace with art. And he had a bizarre style, unsettling, weird. And because this style had been brought out of the Groat, the style was named Grotesque, which means from the underworld. Now these days, the word Grotesque generally describes something bizarre, ugly, or strange. But it also refers to a particular style of art that was inspired in the 15th century by the artwork unearthed in the ruins of Domus Aria and popularized by such Renaissance artists as Raphael. Because the fanciful style involved the mixing of human, animal, and plant shapes, that's how it also became synonymous with sculpted animal and monster heads attached to buildings, which you might remember from our episode about the gargoyle. And now we're back to plundering ancient riches from labyrinthine palaces and gardens buried for centuries but at least we're in the right time period for pseudo-medieval. But that still doesn't quite get us down to a solid answer for when to use the word grotto and when to use the word cave. Well, the Greeks, and the Romans too, were into grottos. In fact, the whole Victorian grotto thing was an imitation of the whole classical garden thing. 
and classical grottoes, which were themselves natural or artificial decorative caves, were also built in imitation of something. And that something is a little bit more magical and fantastical than just ancient buried baths and gardens. See, the word grotto, the Latin word, does mean cave, sure. But classical grottoes were constructed in imitation of something the Greeks called nymphaea. A nymphaeum was a grotto, a cave, that included a natural spring, stream, or other source of water. And they were considered special because, well, because water was magically coming out of the ground in these enclosed spaces. And thus, they were considered to be the home of supernatural creatures called nymphs water spirits. The first nymphaea were naturally occurring cave springs around which sanctuaries or religious sites were built. But gradually, the Greeks started building their own artificial grottos and decorating them with flowers, plants, sculptures, and paintings. In addition to serving as freshwater reservoirs and wells, natural and artificial nymphaea were also used for various religious assemblies. Often weddings were held in such places and such features became an important part of other religious sites, even the shrine at Delphi. The ancient Romans, famous for imitating classical Greek art and architecture, constructed their own grottos in imitation of the Greek nymphaea. They weren't nearly so concerned about the spiritual significance. Thus, their use of the word grotto, derived from the word cave, to describe their own springs and fountains enclosed by natural or artificial caves. And that's the word that described the ruined underworld of Nero's palace, and the word that was adopted by the Victorians who hid cave gardens around and under their own houses. As for you, you can pretty freely use the word grotto for just about any enclosed cave. But for ourselves, we like to make sure it's got some water in it, just to keep us honest in the use of synonyms. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.